Section 20 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. The Argonauts, Part 5. And the heroes sat silent a while before the face of that ancient king, but Hera the awful goddess put courage into Jason's heart, and he rose and shouted loudly in answer, We are no pirates nor lawless men. We come not to plunder and to ravage, or carry away slaves from your land. But my uncle, the son of Poseidon, Peleos the Minuan king, he it is who has sent me on a quest to bring home the golden fleece. And these two, my bold comrades, they are no nameless men for some are the sons of immortals, and some of heroes far renowned. And we, too, never tire in battle, and know well how to give blows and to take. Yet we wish to be guests at your table. It will be better so for both. Then Aetus's rage rushed up like a whirlwind, and his eyes flashed fire as he heard, but he crushed his anger down in his breast, and spoke mildly a cunning speech. If you will fight for the fleece with my Colchians, then many a man must die. But do you indeed expect to win from me the fleece in fight? So few you are, that if you be worsted, I can load your ship with your corpses. But if you will be ruled by me, you will find it far better to choose the best man among you, and let him fulfill the labors which I demand. Then I will give him the golden fleece for a prize and a glory to you all." So saying, he turned his horses and drove back in silence to the town, and the Minuai sat silent with sorrow, and longed for Heracles and his strength, for there was no facing the thousands of the Colchians and the fearful chance of war. But Chalciope, Phreax's widow, went weeping to the town, for she remembered her Minuan husband, and all the pleasures of her youth, while she watched the fair faces of his kinsmen, and their long locks of golden hair. And she whispered to Medea her sister, Why should all these brave men die? Why does not my father give them up the fleece, that my husband's spirit may have rest? And Medea's heart pitied the heroes, and Jason most of all. And she answered, Our father is stern and terrible, and who can win the golden fleece? But Chalciope said, These men are not like our men, there is nothing which they cannot dare nor do. And Medea thought of Jason in his brave countenance, and said, If there was one among them who knew no fear, I could show him how to win the fleece. So in the dusk of evening they went down to the riverside, Chalciope and Medea the witch-maiden, and Argus, Phreax's son. And Argus the boy crept forward among the beds of reeds, till he came where the heroes were sleeping, on the thwarts of the ship, beneath the bank, while Jason kept ward on shore, and leant upon his lance full of thought. And the boy came to Jason and said, I am the son of Phreax, your cousin, and Chalciope my mother waits for you, to talk about the golden fleece. Then Jason went boldly with the boy, and found the two princesses standing, and when Chalciope saw him she wept, and took his hands and cried, O cousin of my beloved, go home before you die. It would be base to go home now, fair princess, and to have sailed all these seas in vain. Then both the princesses besought him, but Jason said, It is too late. But you know not, said Medea, what he must do to who would win the fleece. He must tame the two brazen-footed bulls, who breathe devouring flame, and with them he must plough ere nightfall four acres in the field of Ares, and he must sow them with serpent's teeth, of which each tooth springs up into an armed man. Then he must fight with all those warriors, and little will it profit him to conquer them, for the fleece is guarded by a serpent more huge than any mountain pine, and over his body you must step if you would reach the golden fleece. Then Jason laughed bitterly. Unjustly is that fleece kept here, and by an unjust and lawless king, and unjustly shall I die in my youth, for I will attempt it ere another sun be set. Then Medea trembled and said, 
no mortal man can reach that fleece unless i guide him through for round it beyond the river is a wall full nine ells high with lofty towers and buttresses and mighty gates of threefold brass and over the gates the wall is arched with golden battlements above and over the gateway sits brimo the wild witch huntress of the woods brandishing a pine torch in her hands while her mad hounds howl around no man dare meet her or look on her but only i her priestess and she watches far and wide lest any stranger should come near no wall so high but it may be climbed at last and no wood so thick but it may be crawled through no serpent so wary but he may be charmed or which queen so fierce but spells may soothe her and i may yet win the golden fleece if a wise maiden help bold men and he looked at medea cunningly and held her with his glittering eye till she blushed and trembled and said who can face the fire of the bull's breath and fight ten thousand armed men he whom you help said jason flattering her for your fame is spread over all the earth are you not the queen of all enchantresses wiser than your sister circe in her fairy island in the west would that i were with my sister circe in her fairy island in the west far away from sore temptation and thoughts which tear the heart but if it must be so for why should you die i have an ointment here i have made it from the magic ice flower which sprang from prometheus's wound above the clouds on caucasus in the dreary fields of snow anoint yourself with that and you shall have in you seven men's strength and anoint your shield with it and neither fire nor sword can harm you but what you begin you must end before sunset for its virtue lasts only one day and anoint your helmet with it before you sow the serpent's teeth and when the sons of earth spring up cast your helmet among their ranks and the deadly crop of the war god's field will mow itself and perish then jason fell on his knees before her and thanked her and kissed her hands and she gave him the vase of ointment and fled trembling through the reeds and jason told his comrades what had happened and showed them the box of ointment and all rejoiced but idas and he grew mad with envy and at sunrise jason went and bathed and anointed himself from head to foot and his shield and his helmet and his weapons and bade his comrades try the spell so they tried to bend his lance but it stood like an iron bar and idas in spite hewed at it with his sword but the blade flew to splinters in his face then they hurled their lances at his shield but the spear points turned like lead and Canaeus tried to throw him but he never stirred a foot and polydeuces struck him with his fist a blow which would have killed an ox but jason only smiled and the heroes danced about him with delight and he leapt and ran and shouted in the joy of that enormous strength till the sun rose and it was time to go and claim aetes's promise so he sent up telamon and aethalides to tell aetes that he was ready for the fight and they went up among the marble walls and beneath the roofs of gold and stood in aetes's hall while he grew pale with rage fulfill your promise to us child of the blazing sun give us the serpent's teeth and let loose the fiery bulls for we have found a champion among us who can win the golden fleece and aetes bit his lips for he fancied that they had fled away by night but he did not go back from his promise so he gave them the serpent's teeth then he called for his chariot and his horses and sent heralds through all the town and all the people went out with him to the dreadful war god's field and there aetes sat upon his throne with his warriors on each hand thousands and tens of thousands clothed from head to foot in steel chain mail and the people and the women crowded to every window and bank and wall while the minuai stood together a mere handful in the midst of that great host and chalciope was there and argus trembling and medea wrapped closely in her veil but aetes did not know that she was muttering cunning spells between her lips then jason cried fulfill your promise and let your fiery bulls come forth then aetes bade open the gates and the magic bulls leapt out their brazen hoofs rang upon the ground 
and their nostrils sent out sheets of flame as they rushed with lowered heads upon Jason. But he never flinched a step. The flame of their breath swept round him, but it singed not a hair of his head, and the bulls stopped short and trembled when Medea began her spell. Then Jason sprang upon the nearest and seized him by the horn, and up and down they wrestled till the bull fell groveling on his knees, for the heart of the brute died within him, and his mighty limbs were loosed beneath the steadfast eye of that dark witch-maiden and the magic whisper of her lips. So both the bulls were tamed and yoked, and Jason bound them to the plough and goaded them onward with his lance till he had ploughed the sacred field. And all the Minuai shouted, but Aietes bit his lips with rage, for the half of Jason's work was over, and the sun was yet high in heaven. Then he took the serpent's teeth and sowed them, and waited what would befall. But Medea looked at him and at his helmet, lest he should forget the lesson she had taught. And every furrow heaved and bubbled, and out of every clod rose a man. Out of the earth they rose by thousands, each clad from head to foot in steel, and drew their swords and rushed on Jason, where he stood in the midst alone. Then the Minuai grew pale with fear for him, but Aietes laughed a bitter laugh. See, if I had not warriors enough already around me, I could call them out of the bosom of the earth. But Jason snatched off his helmet and hurled it into the midst of the throng, and blind madness came upon them, suspicion, hate, and fear. And one cried to his fellow, Thou didst strike me. And another, Thou art Jason, thou shalt die. So fury seized those earth-born phantoms, and each turned his hand against the rest, and they fought and were never weary, till they all lay dead upon the ground. Then the magic furrows opened, and the kind earth took them home into her breast, and the grass grew up all green again above them, and Jason's work was done. Then the Minuai rose and shouted, till Prometheus heard them from his crag, and Jason cried, Lead me to the fleece this moment, before the sun goes down. But Aietes thought, He has conquered the bulls, and sown and reaped the deadly crop. Who is this who is proof against all magic? He may kill the serpent yet. So he delayed, and sat taking counsel with his princes, till the sun went down, and all was dark. Then he bade a herald cry, Every man to his home for to-night, to-morrow we will meet these heroes, and speak about the golden fleece. Then he turned and looked at Medea. This is your doing, false witch maid. You have helped these yellow-haired strangers, and brought shame upon your father and yourself. Medea shrank and trembled, and her face grew pale with fear, and Aietes knew that she was guilty, and whispered, If they win the fleece, you die. But the Minuai marched toward their ship, growling like lions cheated of their prey, for they saw that Aietes meant to mock them and to cheat them out of all their toil. And Oileus said, Let us go to the grove together and take the fleece by force. And Idas the rash cried, Let us draw lots who shall go in first, for while the dragon is devouring one, the rest can slay him and carry off the fleece in peace. But Jason held them back, though he praised them, for he hoped for Medea's help. And after a while Medea came trembling, and wept a long while before she spoke, and at last, My end is come, and I must die, for my father has found out that I have helped you. You he would kill if he dared, but he will not harm you, because you have been his guests. Go then, go, and remember poor Medea when you are far away across the sea. But all the heroes cried, if you die, we die with you, for without you we cannot win the fleece, and home we will not go without it, but fall here fighting to the last man. You need not die, said Jason. Flee home with us across the sea. Show us first how to win the fleece, for you can do it. Why else are you the priestess of the grove? Show us but how to win the fleece, and come with us, and you shall be my queen, and rule over the rich princes of the Minuai in Iolcos by the sea. And all the heroes pressed round, and vowed to her that she should be their queen. 
Medea wept and shuddered and hid her face in her hands, for her heart yearned after her sisters and her playfellows, and the home where she was brought up as a child. But at last she looked up at Jason, and spoke between her sobs. Must I leave my home and my people, to wander with strangers across the sea? The lot is cast, and I must endure it. I will show you how to win the golden fleece. Bring up your ship to the woodside, and moor her there against the bank, and let Jason come up at midnight, and one brave comrade with him, and meet me beneath the wall. Then all the heroes cried together, I will go, and I, and I. And Idas the rash grew mad with envy, for he longed to be foremost in all things. But Medea calmed them, and said, Orpheus shall go with Jason, and bring his magic harp, for I hear of him that he is the king of all minstrels, and can charm all things on earth. And Orpheus laughed for joy, and clapped his hands, because the choice had fallen on him, for in those days poets and singers were as bold warriors as the best. So at midnight they went up the bank, and found Medea, and beside came Absyrtus, her young brother, leading a yearling lamb. Then Medea brought them to a thicket beside the war-god's gate, and there she bade Jason dig a ditch and kill the lamb and leave it there, and strew on it magic herbs and honey from the honeycomb. Then sprang up through the earth, with the red fire flashing before her, Brimo, the wild witch huntress, while her mad hounds howled around. She had one head like a horse's, and another like a ravening hound's, and another like a hissing snake's, and a sword in either hand. And she leapt into the ditch with her hounds, and they ate and drank their fill, while Jason and Orpheus trembled, and Medea hid her eyes. And at last the witch-queen vanished, and fled with her hounds into the woods. And the bars of the gates fell down, and the brazen doors flew wide, and Medea and the heroes ran forward and hurried through the poison wood, among the dark stems of the mighty beeches, guided by the gleam of the golden fleece, until they saw it hanging on one vast tree in the midst. And Jason would have sprung to seize it, but Medea held him back, and pointed shuddering to the tree foot, where the mighty serpent lay coiled in and out among the roots, with a body like a mountain pine. His coils stretched many a fathom, spangled with bronze and gold, and half of him they could see, but no more, for the rest lay in the darkness far beyond. And when he saw them coming, he lifted up his head, and watched them with his small bright eyes, and flashed his forked tongue, and roared like a fire among the woodlands, till the forest tossed and groaned, for his cry shook the trees from leaf to root, and swept over the long reaches of the river, and over Aetes' hall, and woke the sleepers in the city, till mothers clasped their children in their fear. But Medea called gently to him, and he stretched out his long-spotted neck, and licked her hand, and looked up in her face as if to ask for food. Then she made a sign to Orpheus, and he began his magic song. And as he sang, the forest grew calm again, and the leaves on every tree hung still, and the serpent's head sank down, and his brazen coils grew limp, and his glittering eyes closed lazily, till he breathed as gently as a child, while Orpheus called to pleasant slumber, who gives peace to men and beasts and waves. Then Jason leapt forward warily, and stepped across that mighty snake, and tore the fleece from off the tree trunk, and the four rushed down the garden to the bank where the Argo lay. There was a silence for a moment while Jason held the golden fleece on high. Then he cried, Go now, good Argo, swift and steady, if ever you would see Pelion more. And she went, as the heroes drove her, grim and silent all, with muffled oars, till the pine wood bent like willow in their hands, and stout Argo groaned beneath their strokes. On and on, beneath the dewy darkness, they fled swiftly down the swirling stream, underneath black walls and temples and the castles of the princes of the east, past sluice mouths and fragrant gardens and groves of all strange fruits, past marshes where fat kine lay sleeping and long beds of whispering reeds, till they heard the merry music of the surge upon the bar as it tumbled in the moonlight all alone. 
into the surge they rushed, and Argo leapt the breakers like a horse, for she knew the time was come to show her mettle and win honour for the heroes and herself. Into the surge they rushed, and Argo leapt the breakers like a horse, till the heroes stopped all panting, each man upon his oar, as she slid into the still broad sea. Then Orpheus took his harp and sang a paean, till the heroes' hearts rose high again, and they rode on stoutly and steadfastly away into the darkness of the west. End of section 20